So welcome to the 40 Plus Fitness for Women podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about our total daily energy expenditure. And this is a topic that I think it's really important for everybody to understand where their calories are being spent because it's much more than just the exercising that you're doing every day. And I'm also going to be going over kind of some habit changes or lifestyle changes that you can do in order to be spending more calories every day. That way you can be eating more food or maybe even having an easier time losing weight. So let's get into it. So first of all, let's think about what our total daily energy expenditure is comprised of. It has four different components. So first of all, you have your basal metabolic rate. So this is just the energy that our body needs to maintain its basic bodily functions like breathing, your blood circulation, cell production, all the things. And this accounts for 60 to 70% of all the calories that we use every day. So that is a huge chunk. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how you can actually increase your basal metabolic rate. Then the second thing is you've got the thermic effect of food. So it actually takes some energy to digest and metabolize food. And this accounts for approximately 10% of our total calorie expenditure every day. So the third one is our non-exercise activity thermogenesis or NEAT. You hear this talked about a lot. And that is the movement that you do, the calories that you spend moving around in a way that isn't actually like planned exercises. So this could be like the arm movements that you do when you're uh, talking. It could be the tapping of your foot. Some people have these kinds of tics. It's um, the activity that you have during the day working. Let's say if you were an electrician and you're moving around, you're going to have a lot more neat than somebody who sits at a desk job. And that accounts for about 20 to 30% of our daily calorie expenditure. And then finally, there's the calories that most of us are actually tracking when we're exercising, which is the exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's the energy our body expends during planned exercise or structured physical activity. So like when you go running or lifting weights or taking a fitness class. And now this can vary a lot between individuals based on their exercise habits, but it only accounts for about 10 to 20% of our daily calorie expenditure. Now, I have to say after that, that When we're talking about these percentages, obviously they can vary greatly. So if I think back, for example, in my own life, when I was in college and playing division one sports, I was practicing two hours a day. Plus I was going to the weight room and I was running on top of that. So it was not unusual for me to spend three hours a day exercising. So obviously it was a larger amount than 20% of my total daily calorie expenditure. And nowadays when I exercise four days a week, five days a week for an hour, that's obviously going to be a much smaller amount of exercise activity thermogenesis. So that's going to be closer to this, you know, in in this 10 to 20% of our total daily calorie expenditure range. So, you know, take those percentages with a bit of a grain of salt and recognize that they are going to change a lot between people. So, but that is sort of the basics of what they are. But now let's talk about each of them in turn and kind of what you can do to tweak them in a higher direction. Because of course, the more calories we spend during the day, the more we can be eating or not gaining weight with the amount of food that we're eating. And that's super important. So let's start with our basal metabolic rate. So how can we affect this? Now, first of all, The thing about our basal metabolic rate is a lot of people think that it goes down as we age. And 
actually, there's a recent study that was done on a very wide uh, audience of people and from all kinds of age groups, all the way from children to older adults, they had men and women and, and all kinds of people. And what they found was that actually between the ages of 20 and 60, our basal metabolic rate stays approximately the same if your muscle mass stays the same. So this was like a really, really interesting and key finding. But the fact of the matter is that as we age, starting at about age 20, our muscle mass starts to decline unless we're actually weight training and doing something about it. So of course, you know, if, if you are like most people that you're not going to the weight room, then your basal metabolic rate is going to start to decrease over time as your lean muscle mass percentage in your body starts to decrease. So here we go. This is our first kind of tip is that if you want to increase your basal metabolic rate, you should make sure that you are not letting your muscle mass decline and even better would be that if you can build more muscle. So this is probably something that you've heard is that muscle burns more calories even at rest. So when you change your body composition to include more muscle, you'll burn more calories every day. This does not happen overnight. <laughs> Obviously building muscle takes time, but this is a really good habit to get into for the rest of your life because you will slow down or you will stop, hopefully, the decrease in your basal metabolic rate due to this loss of muscle. And then you may even increase your muscle mass and therefore be able to eat more because you're burning more. So if you're not doing any kind of systematic weight training today, get started as soon as possible. And I say as soon as possible because it actually will only get harder as you get older. And the reasons are for women that as you go into perimenopause and into menopause, there are hormonal changes in your body which make it more difficult for you to retain and, and also build muscle. So listen to episode three for tips on how to get started and episode five for the factors that you need to have in your exercising to actually make it effective in building muscle. So that was about our basal metabolic rate. So it would be great if we have high metabolic rate. It actually reminds me of, um, yeah, <laughs> a story, uh, well, and this was a much younger person, but a friend of mine, she's super tall and lean and her children are also super tall uh, and lean. She has two sons and uh, the oldest one, when he was in law school, he decided that, okay, I'm tired of being this beanpole and I want to put on muscle. And oh my God, you know, for him to put on muscle and to maintain the muscle that he had, he had to eat so much food. He said he spent his days just eating and eating and eating and eating. Because if he wasn't eating enough, his body would start to, of course, use his muscle as fuel or not put on more muscle. So yeah, so it can really affect that. I actually should ask him, he, he doesn't live far from me. I should ask him like how many calories a day he eats now because, you know, he's tall and muscular. He must have to eat quite a bit to maintain those muscles and uh, yeah, of course, for him, it's kind of a hassle, but for the rest of us, that might be heaven, right? To have to eat that ice cream. So let's talk about the thermic effect of food next. So you probably know that we have three different macronutrients that are talked about all over social media and all over the place. They are fats, carbohydrates, and protein. And the thing is that these three are not built alike when it comes to thermic effect of food. 
protein has the highest thermic effect which means that the body expends more energy digesting and metabolizing protein than it does carbohydrates or fats. So eat more protein (laughs) or eat a more protein rich diet. And for people in their forties and fifties, this is super important anyway. Because eating enough protein means that your body is able to maintain more of that lean muscle mass that you have. So that'll help out with your basal metabolic rate as well at the same time. So you should be aiming for about one gram per pound of body weight. And I will tell you that that is not something that comes, you know, without trying. I really recommend that everybody spend a week, just just a week, actually measuring the food that they eat and tracking it in one of these calorie counters. I use, what is it called? Fat something. Fat secret is what I use. Uh, I find it's pretty easy to find foods in there. And I bet you, if you go in there and you actually track what you're eating each week, then you will notice that you are not eating nearly enough protein and that it really takes some effort. And so start structuring your your diet around protein. Your meals, first decide on what's the protein going to be and then choose the other things. And I'll tell you something wonderful about protein as well is that it leaves you feeling more satiated. So you won't feel hungry as quickly with the protein. So three great reasons to eat protein. One is that it helps maintain your muscles and helps you build muscles if you are weight training. Two is that your body uses up more calories breaking down protein than any of the other macronutrients. And the third thing is that it leaves you feeling full for longer and more full, so you won't be as hungry. So all fabulous, fabulous reasons to start eating more protein. Easy way to biohack your thermic effect of food figure upward. All right, so let's get into NEAT next. So NEAT is actually something that uses up even more calories for the average person than our or exercise activity. And what is NEAT? It is the movement that you do. So if you're waving your arms and all this kind of thing, that's NEAT. And it's also the movement that you do throughout your day. So this is going to be very variable depending on what kind of work you have. So for me, I sit still pretty much 10, 12 hours a day. So my NEAT would naturally be super duper low. Whereas a friend of mine who is an electrician, he is spending the whole day like doing short drives, then walking into the location that he needs to work, moving his arms around as he's like doing his work and then back to the car and whatever. So his daily uh, movement is much, much higher than mine is. And a good way to get a sense of what your need is is to track your step count. And this is one of the reasons I think the step count is is a good indicator and something that you should be like tracking. Because if you notice, like I do, that if I'm working from home, my step count is pathetic, right? And I've started to build in little habits to increase my need over the course of the day like every hour trying to stand up and and go take a walk around the house for three minutes. When I'm (laughs) creating my reels, uh, a lot of the editing I do on my phone. So I go and I pace back and forth in my uh, hallway while I'm doing that. So I get a little bit of movement and I make sure that I'm using my standing desk. So I'll raise it up. So that takes a little bit more energy, that standing and and then, for example, if I'm meeting where I'm just talking, uh, I will you can take my standing desk and put it up. And then I do like marching in place. People on the other end can't 
notice anything while I'm like lifting my feet up or, or kicking them out to the sides, just trying to get a little bit more movement in the day. But even with all that, it has been really, really challenging to get enough steps, enough motion for me in the day. And so I now have invested in a walking pad. So it's like a lightweight treadmill that I can walk on at a very slow pace. And I believe that by using that, let's say one hour a day, I am going to really, really be able to bring up my NEAT. Yeah. So an, an interesting fact about NEAT is that your body actually will naturally decrease the amount of NEAT that you're doing when you're in a calorie deficit. So your body wants to maintain equilibrium. It doesn't like calorie deficits, doesn't like diets. So it will lower the amount that you're moving when you're on on a diet. And for me, it also happens when I am tired. <laughs> so, so to keep your neat up, uh, recognize that being in a diet is going to probably affect your neat. And so then you really want to be kind of tracking your steps and making sure that you're forcing yourself to move and also get enough sleep so that your body has the energy to do this wiggling and doesn't just sit still. Okay. And then finally, uh, the fourth aspect is our calories due to our exercise. So obviously to increase the calories we use exercising, we can exercise more. Okay. <laughs> and the problem with this is maybe that it isn't going to be so sustainable. You also need to think about injury risks about how your body adapts to that increased exercise and also the cortisol levels that are spiked by heavy exercise. Sorry, a sip of coffee in between here. So, so let's think about it. Now, if you want to sort of create your life around all right, I want to lose weight or I want to maintain a lower weight, so I'm going to exercise more. Well, really think about how sustainable that is for you and your um, calendar. So like I said, when I was 20, I had a really easy time spending three hours a day, you know, working out three to five hours a day with my practices and weight training and running and all the things. But Nowadays, when I'm working, when I have children, I need to cook, I need to drive them, I have a boyfriend I want to spend time with, and an active social life. So really, you know, the five hours a week is already pretty much pushing it for me. I don't know about you, <laughs> but in any case, so how sustainable is that, that you try to just add more exercise into your calorie, uh, into your calendar. And then the other thing is that, of course, there is the increased risk of injury and overdoing it. So at one point, for example, I was doing a lot of very mm, brisk cardio classes and, you know, my Achilles tendons started to complain about that. And I kept going and kept going and they complained a little bit more. And yeah, it finally led to about nine months of not doing high intensity um, aerobics training before I got them back in shape. So, so there is an injury risk associated with more and more and more exercise. And then also there's adaptation that happens. So you're not going to get as many calories out of a particular exercise um, as your body gets used to it. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense if you think about it, like if you pick up a new hobby, like you, you start running, right? The first time you go out running, your body is going, it's going to feel like hell, right? <laughs> I mean, anybody who's tried this or taken a long break, it feels like hell the first time you go out because your body's not used to it because you, you don't know how to breathe, whatever, all the things. But 
your body adapts. It gets better at that. It gets better at breathing. You get in shape, like in shape for running. And then in order to push your body, you need to do like a longer run and a longer run or a harder run and all these things. And um, in order to burn the same amount of calories. So please be aware that if you're using a sports tracker, you know, to track your calories, those are not accurate. And the more in shape you are, like probably the less accurate that they're going to get. So my point was that a workout, which may have in half an hour burned X number of calories, let's say 300 calories, uh, when you first started doing it, as your body adapts and gets in better shape, you're actually going to need to do like 45 minutes of that same kind of workout to get that same calorie burn. And then it's going to be an hour and then, you know, more and more and more and more. And so as a long-term strategy for managing your weight and health, that probably is not going to really work because think about the sustainability and the injury risk, right? That are associated with and training longer and longer and longer. And then finally, like cortisol levels are something to keep in mind. So when you're in perimenopause, your base cortisol levels are higher than they were when you were younger in your childbearing years or whatever you want to call them, pre-perimenopause years. And so you want to be aware that you're going to be increasing your cortisol levels when you do this very high intensity kind of exercise or medium intensity exercise. What I want to be giving here is like habits that you can adopt that aren't going to stress you out and that you can do them long term. So what are the kind of takeaways from this. So we can affect our basal metabolic rate by building more muscle, right? So if we shift our cardio exercises to having strength training exercises, then that will help us to build more muscle and the muscle burns more calories even at rest and helps to increase your basal metabolic rate. You can listen to episodes three uh, for tips on how to get started and especially episode five for the factors that you really need to have in your exercise so that they do actually build muscle. Then you can increase the amount of protein that you're eating. And I mean, I recommend this anyway, especially for women in their forties and fifties and beyond. I think most of us are just eating way too little protein and it is important because it will help us to maintain that lean muscle mass that we have or slow down the rate of degeneration of it. And, you know, the extra bonuses are that it has the high thermic effect of food. So you'll burn more calories while you're eating it than if you had chosen carbohydrates or fats instead. Plus, it helps you feel full longer. And I really, I have actually really noticed, especially that effect as I have increased my protein intake. It's really amazing. And then think about your daily habits and how you can increase your NEAT. Like, so those daily steps, I, I think it is a good idea to track it, not so that you become like crazy over it, right? Right but so that you get an indicator that, wow, okay, look, today I've only gotten in like 4,000 steps. So maybe tonight's not the night to collapse on the couch and just watch TV. I mean, even if you wanted to watch TV, you could pace back and forth in front of the TV and it doesn't need to be fast pacing. It can be slow pacing. You can do a little bit of marching in place. Um, if you have a standing desk, take advantage of it. Take three minute breaks throughout your work day, walk around just to get a little bit more neat, you know, and if there's an option to move a little bit, do a little bit of moving, right? Just get into some habits that get you moving more. Yes. So I think that those were the conclusions from this week. I hope that this has given you some ideas of how you can shift your own habits into a more fit and sustainable direction so that you can live at a happy weight 
for the rest of your life. And um, if you enjoyed the podcast and learned something, I would love, love, love to hear from you. <laughs> it's kind of quiet here in podcast land. And if you know anybody who would find this information useful, then please do share the podcast. I will talk to you next time. In the meanwhile, happy training.